So I'm 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 Casper. I'm here to uh, to give you uh, some insights into what we're uh, doing with Dart for Mobile and um, and how we feel like we can actually um, change uh, mobile for the better. So when we talk about mobile, um, it's probably no surprise that it's the two devices on the on the left that that has uh, sort of our, our attention. Uh, you already now have ways of running Dart code in that context. But what we're looking at here is is a way of of giving you flexibility to run Dart in a more native-like setting uh, and still provide a lot of the, the nice values and the features that you, you know from Dart. So why is it that people want to use Dart on mobile? Well, Dart is a modern and light technology stack, and our focus on developed productivity seems to fit really well in, in, in the mobile space. The one thing that uh, I also mentioned in the keynote is that, that code sharing across multiple client apps or perhaps different variants of the same, same app seems to be something that is really compelling, especially for large teams that struggle when they have to deliver like three different variants of the same app. Uh, so imagine you, you have a very complicated application like a to-do sample here, uh, and you want to deliver three ver versions of it, uh, three different UIs, all running the same core model. It's a little bit painful to have to uh, write that core model in Java, in Objective-C, and maybe some C++ code in the middle. So it would be nice to be able to just take that part of your business logic, dump it, in, dump it into Dart, and just skin it for the different kind of uh, UIs. What you see on the left is the Android version. What you see on the right is the iOS versions. And in both cases, there's actually a running sample. I can show you to it if you want to see it. Um, but in both cases, they're using native uh, widgets. Uh, so it feels exactly like a native, native app. It's just that all the content that you sh show here, that just comes from a, from a Dart application. So it's a fairly simple setup. So you have like a UI for iOS and a UI for Android. Let's just focus on those two. The, uh, the client or command line version is not that interesting in this case. Um, and underneath that, you have your application model written in Dart. Um, and I mean, in this case, the application model is fairly simple. But there are lots of cases where it's really, really complicated. And it's really core parts of your, your offering that will fit in there. To actually make this application model fly on these devices, we have to talk about uh, what it means to have a Dart runtime there. So the Dart runtime is the, the part of the stack that actually runs your Dart applications. And uh, already now, we have a really uh, great offering for, uh, for Android. But for, um, for iOS, because of some of the restrictions in that platform, we've had to do a little bit of engineering to try to, to come up with a new solution in that space. So let's look a little bit at that, that runtime system and, uh, and dive into what Fletch is and, and what it will become. So Fletch is a Dart runtime for mobile. It's uh, targeting the, the iOS space where we have a sort of a hole in our offering. There's no great way of running Dart code on iOS today, and that's what we're trying to sort of plug with this thing. It's a, it's a new thing, um, so it's not a product yet. It's not something you can like, pick down uh, from GitHub today and, uh, and use for building real things, but it's something we're, uh, we're uh, productizing over the next uh, quarters. So what is it really? It's a small and, and elegant runtime system. Um, it's a, it supports on-the-fly program changes to keep uh, the right level of productivity for you guys. So that means that we'll allow you to basically change the program while it's executing on a mobile device. Um, so to make that whole edit, compile, refresh cycle really, really smooth. Um, it actually also runs on iOS through interpretation. And that might be the, the, the key selling point here is that this is a way for you guys to write dot code that runs on iOS. Um, in, a, in a mobile setting. So some of the sort of key characteristics are um, kind of interesting here. It, it's designed to be very light, uh, interactive in a sense, and also very concurrent. So the lightness is, uh, I mean, it's hard to measure that with just one metric. But I'll, I'll throw out some numbers here to give you an indication of where we're going with this. Like first of all, we made it so that it starts up really, really quickly, in, even on these mobile devices, so that adding uh, Dart support to your mobile application doesn't really cost you on the start of your app. So we're looking at around two milliseconds for starting and shutting down a, a small Dart app, like a Hello World thing. Uh, but that's really sort of uh, probably as low as we can almost get. We might maybe <laughs> make it twice as fast. But it, the way we've done this is to like, really um, double down on the, uh, on the implementations of the snapshots and uh, uh, use the fact that the snapshots that the Fletch system runs have uh, uh, bytecodes in there that are ready to be interpreted from like the first millisecond. So there's no parsing or scanning overhead. So it's a very simple thing that way. It also have a low memory overhead. Um, 
Right now, it's around 200K in binary size. That means that it's, it doesn't add a lot of dead weight to your application to just throw it in there, even if you only want to add a few methods of dot code to your system. And we feel like it's really important for us to stay in that space so that uh, we, can, we can work at sort of as, as an add-on to an existing app. Um, so even if we're not providing a ton of value yet, the cost of including it is not sort of prohibitive. Um, so we're focusing on something very small, very lightweight, and very simple. The, the interactive part is, uh, is kind of interesting. Uh, we heard a question uh, uh, during the panel today that that's the, like the one missing thing in Dart is the, the ability to update code and work with it in a sort of more interactive and live way. Um, we've built a Fletch to have a, a wire protocol for doing program changes um, in an atomic way. So that means that you can change multiple things in your app and then apply them in one go. Sometimes you're changing some things in one method that depends on other changes to be live at the same time. So you can bundle them up and then apply them in an atomic way over a wire protocol. And this extends to basically all the things you, you might change in a program. You can change the superclass hierarchy, add new fields to, a, to a classes, add new methods, of course, and mess with the implementations of these things. It just gives you a very fluent way. And, and one way of thinking of this is it's a very, very powerful debugger. It, it's, a, it's really a, a compelling thing to have. And this is a known thing from other languages and other systems, and we're just trying to bring that technology to Dart as well, even in a setting where you're running your uh, development environment on one machine and your, your system on a, on a mobile phone. The third thing that we're doing, uh, which is a bit more sort of experimental, is the work on isolates that, that makes us uh, sort of even more concurrent than we are today. We're, uh, we're experimenting with making it a lot cheaper to do blocking operations because they're conceptually a lot simpler than the async, uh, async uh, implementations. Uh, but it has to be really, really cheap so you don't get scalability issues out of that. Another thing that we, we've uh, made work here is that it actually scales to uh, like 100,000 concurrent uh, isolates. And we've done this by being really, really aggressive in uh, how much we can share between these isolates and have them start out really, really small. So if you're doing like, just a few computations, like, like one example here was the uh, let's block on some database query, then basically you're not doing a lot of work in that isolate. So the overhead can be really small. Um, an isolate starts out being around 4K of memory. Um, and that includes the object heap and a small stack for the execution. And then it grows from there. And the, the trick is, of course, to share all the program structures, all the classes, all the bytecodes between all the isolates that run the same sort of code base, you could say, and just only pay for the differences. So how does it all fit in? Uh, let's focus on the iOS case. Um, on iOS, uh, you might have a lot of native code that uh, uses native widgets. And you might have some Dart code in the mix as well. Underneath that thing, there is this Fletch runtime that runs it. Um, and on your development machine, that might be a little bit weird to use a Linux machine up against a, an iOS device, but let's, let's assume that works well. Um, you have your, your, your SDK that allows you to debug, inspect, modify code as it's running. And this sort of thing I point out here is the sort of the wire protocol that allows us to interact with the runtime, change things, and inspect the state and work with the code. Sort of a really powerful debugging interface, you could say. So if, if we dive into what this SDK might turn into, this is a little bit um, um, sort of up in the air in the sense that this is a preview of what we might actually put in there. So it's a little bit of a vision thing. But I just want to give you a feel for how this thing actually might play out. Um, at the core of it, we want to make sure that we have great command line tools for working with that code. And we feel like focusing on command line first <coughs> is a nice place to start. It allows us to sort of formulate the concepts and the things you work with, and then sort of build from there. So this is probably going to look a little bit like a, an interactive debugger in many ways. So we imagine that having a way of running uh, Dart code through a, a tool like this, starting it up maybe on, on the device or maybe on, in, a, in a local setting, would feel pretty natural to most people. Of course, you can set breakpoints in your code and, and interact with it through that. And imagine you set a breakpoint in an update display method, and uh, you hit that breakpoint, and I said pauses. And you can see in the, in the command line here, uh, in this output, that you pause at a speci specific uh, expression in there. So this, is like, this is just like a debugger, you could say. So what happens if you realize that there actually is a small bug here or something you'd like to play with? And maybe, maybe this code is not exactly what it should be. Um, you can step through and like, actually sort of understand why it's not doing what you expect it to do. Like, for instance, if you debug and step to the next statement, you might see that the state changes, like the x plus uh, position variable here changes its value from null to, to 20 in this case. 
Maybe that's not what you were expecting. Maybe it should have been something else. So if you wanted to fix a number in here and say, that, that number is not entirely correct, I want to update that to 100 instead, for instance, um, you would just go edit that in your uh, favorite editor, and the system would realize that you've done a change and tell you about that when you start applying them. So it might look something like this. Like, we can tell that you've updated this 10 to 100, and we can apply all these changes to the running system in an atomic operation, and we can actually tell you exactly what we're doing to which methods, and just like, apply it and make it happen. Once you've changed code over there, you may want to restart the method and like, start over and, and do the computations again if that's safe. And let's assume that it is, so you just like, rewind the method and start stepping through it. Now it's a plus 100 instead, so it behaves a little bit differently, so you get a 110 out instead of the 20. And assuming that was what you wanted, you've updated your code, um, and you, uh, you learned something about how it works in practice. And like, updating is actually an interesting part, but also this, this notion of working with the code in a live setting is really powerful. It gives you better insights into how it's actually behaving. And just feeling comfortable just trying things out is, is really powerful. You can, of course, debug uh, even more, delete breakpoints and, and resume, and, 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 and off you go. So this is just to illustrate like, how this atomic uh, application of changes could, could work out. Like We will keep track of what you changed, and we'll allow you to update them in one go over a wire protocol. So Fletch as a, um, as a runtime system for iOS is something we really want to, to get out to you uh, so you can start building things that run on iOS in a nice way. So um, we're working very hard on, on uh, getting a an early uh, version of it ready in, the, in Q3 um, so that it's, uh, it's ready for proper feedback from, from you guys. And then we want to productize it and make it into a, a real thing that you can depend on uh, later this year. It's only part of the story, right? Because um, having a way of running dot code on mobile is exciting, at least to some of us. But we also need to figure out what do you then build on top and how do we make all that fit together. So the, the, there's something missing here. Just after we have the runtime system, we need to start building real applications. And I'm, I'm going to dive into how we see that happening. We call that dot for mobile. It's, um, on, in the iOS case, we, we consider building this on top of the runtime. Um, and we have some guiding principles in, in this space. We want to um, have a nice layered approach where we make use of existing nat native functionality. We want to keep it um, low level, fast, and simple. Um, and we want to try to inf avoid enforcing too many abstractions. So we want to make sure that if the abstractions that we provide are um, not entirely correct for what you're doing, there is m there's a lower level you can go to and build your own frameworks on top instead. So it's, it's, it's an attempt to make um, a, a sort of a layer of, of offerings here, where um, if, if the highest level of abstraction that we offer is slightly uh, wrong for you, there is a layer below you can go to. I'm going to give you examples of what these layers might look like, and maybe that makes it a little bit more concrete. At least this is like, like the guiding principle for what we're doing. So the way we uh, interact or inter uh, interoperate with, uh, with native code is through a sort of cross-language support based on a structured messaging mechanism. So imagine you have UI code for Android written in Java, and you have some UI code for iOS written in Objective-C, and you have hopefully lots and lots of dark code that are exposing a number of services to, to this UI code. We're building support for uh, allowing you to access all these services in a, a, a low-level but fairly sane way. So the way it looks like is that you have a description of a service, um, and it's a sort of an, a low-level IDL format. Uh, in, in this case, there's an echo service that has a simple echo method. You can see that the, it's actually describing how many bits these integers are going to take up in the, uh, in the uh, protocol. Uh, so it's, it's designed to be fairly low-level, so you can, uh, you, can, uh, you can tweak it and make things very compact. On the Dart side, if you want to implement this service, it's fairly straightforward. You just go ahead and implement the echo method, and in this case, just return the integer. Um, the interesting part is really on the, uh, on the client side. We're generating code to make all this fit together, and we're generating steps on for C++, works well in, in the Objective-C case too, uh, that allows you to call these methods as static methods. Um, and you can choose if you want to call them in a synchronous way, where you wait for the result. In a lot of cases, that's the simplest version. But there are also cases if you're doing work from a UI thread that it really doesn't work for you to block and wait. So we allow you to call these things in an async way too and get a callback when the things are done. 
Um, in C++, there is no built-in support for futures or promises or even async and await. So here it's uh, back to uh, somewhat annoying callbacks. It's low level, uh, and we do imagine that people will build something on top. It's really fast, though, and I think that's the, the core point here. It's, um, it's low level and fast, and it's fairly simple um, to extend. Like the Java version is, is, is somewhat sim similar. The, uh, the biggest difference is in the async case where you're not passing a function reference, but a some sort of uh, instance of an interface. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we, at the lowest level, imagine binding things together. Clearly, just passing integers back and forth is not that interesting. Um, you can do things with that, but uh, it's a little bit limiting. So we do allow you to have more structured messages. So there is a, a, f a format for describing these uh, structures, and they can have fields, and they can have like basically entire trees of structures that you can build. Um, and you can serialize them into a binary form. That's the one we send across. Uh, and the, the reason why we're doing this, even though it feels maybe annoying to, have, uh, to, to write this and a bit cumbersome to use, is that we want these languages to have a shared understanding of what they're interacting over and what kind of data types flow between them. So in this case, uh, you can see that you can build an entire tree of, of, of persons, like a hierarchy here with the, the children list. Um, and then you might actually send a reference to a, sort of a structure of these things across the wire and get a count of all the people or persons in a, in a tree bank. Everything runs in the same process in this model, uh, which makes a lot of things a lot simpler. Um, so the messages that we send are actually encoded as binary data. Um, we don't do any sort of expensive encoding or decoding. We're not producing a, a tree of dot objects that you walk through after, afterwards. We're actually just basically just deconstructing this binary thing as you work with the, uh, with the structure. So if there are areas you never touch in that binary message, it costs nothing. And this is in contrast with JSON or even protobufs, where you usually build up a dot representation of the entire message and then start looking into it. So really, like the binary data that you send across is the primary thing. Again, low level, but very efficient. Um, the reason why everything runs in the same process is that like, we allow the native application to, to be in control of this process. It's the one invoking all the dot services. We just link it into the same application. And the dot runtime, in many ways, it doesn't really uh, it's just an uh, implementation detail of your native app that you've decided to include a runtime that runs some dot code too. It's very simple. So I'd like to try to show you a demo of what we can do with this thing uh, on an iPad. So let me try to switch to that. So we've, we've built a, um, a small sample here. It's run, it runs on Dart on top of a fetch runtime. And it, uh, it talks to uh, some GitHub APIs. And it shows you um, a list of GitHub commits for the, the fetch project. Um, let me fire it up. So one of the hardest things you do in this space is these infinite scrolling lists of whatnot. So you have basically a lot of data inside the, uh, the, the dot model, and you want to show a, a part of it, a view of it, um, and you want to update that view as you scroll through the, uh, the thing here. So all the, uh, all the data you have uh, in here are actually uh, stored in the, in the dot side of the world. And uh, it's, it's super smooth and uh, sort of a real native widget uh, thing. There is even a sort of a, a, a pagination going on that we will fetch things in the background uh, when we feel like we're getting close to the limit and, and fill in more data. All that stuff happens on the Dart side. And uh, the only thing that we then communicate from, from the Dart uh, part of the world to the native part, in this case the iOS version, is the, is the, is the thing you can see on the screen. So we can scroll back and forth, and you can come play with it afterwards. It's, it's a fairly simple thing, but it just shows that you can take something that involves like talking to a server written in Dart and expose it to, uh, to native code in a fairly efficient way. Like, Fletch is not the fastest system in the world in the sense that it's doing pure interpretation on this device. Um, but uh, I mean, in a lot of cases, it's certainly fast enough to build these like, real things. Uh, so it looks pretty promising to that extent, um, and we can we can. We can continue scrolling here. We'll just fill in more information. There. It builds up fairly large structures quickly, but it looks pretty good. Does that make sense? Let, let's talk a little bit about how that's actually built. So it's sort of an, sort of an infinite uh, uh, GitHub commit list. We show them with native widgets. And the way we plug all these things together is using, at the lowest level, this uh, service description um, that we, we then build things on top of. So, in this case, we've decided to build a layer on top of the services that have a 
sort of a React inspired or a, or a sort of unidirectional uh, flow model for uh, showing uh, parts of a Dart model in a native UI. The way it actually works is fairly simple, at least in the abstract. Like you have a Dart model that defines a presentation graph, and in this case, the presentation graph is what's actually shown on the, on the, uh, on the device. So it's not everything, it's the subset that you can see. That is a presentation that then is interpreted by the native UI, turned into native widget, you can say. And um, if the native UI determines that you're doing something to some of these elements, it will delegate event back to the presentation, and these events will then potentially update state inside the model, like telling the system that you've scrolled. So um, it feels like a fairly nice model for it, because it decouples the Dart model from the native UI in a very clean and sane way. All they sort of interact with is, is presentation stuff, and they do it in a very orderly manner by letting sort of everything flow in a sort of unidirectional way. I'm not expecting you can actually read this. I'll go into the details so you can see it later. Don't worry too much about it. But basically, you have a Dart model on the side with Dart code. You have a presentation in the middle, which is a, um, a small language for defining this presentation graph. Uh, and then there is native uh, iOS code on the, on, the, on the right side here for in constructing real table views uh, and cells for those, uh, and delegating events back. So if we start at the presentation level here, um, let's talk about what that thing is and how we can define it. As I said, it is defined on top of the, uh, of the service description that we built, but we found that it's actually kind of nice to be able to introduce uh, this notion of nodes in this presentation graph. These are application-specific uh, data types, you can say, and in this case, it's, it corresponds to a list of commits, that is like the visible stuff, and uh, some of these commit nodes with uh, an author and a message and a way of sending back, delegating events back into the system, in this case by clicking something, for instance. So you can write this for your application, write the data types that make sense for you, and uh, you can create this from, uh, from the Dart side then, and let's take, take a look at how that might look. The Dart model will actually take, find some way of fetching information from the network or building that up, build a model and then basically have a method called, in this case, present, that will return a node from this presentation graph, constructed like Flux and React. Uh, on demand, you create this list node with some commits in there, and then the system actually will look at uh, the last presentation graph you sent across to the other side, do a diff of those two things, and only send like a patch set across the wire. Um, and it, we do this for you by, if you use this kind of way of defining a presentation graph, we give you the, the diffing algorithms and all that for free. Um, so all you have to do is basically think about, in abstract terms, what things constitute my presentation. And then, of course, you have to write the code, too, that actually takes the presentation and turns it into real native UI widgets. You could imagine building like a, a more generic set of uh, presentation graph nodes and then share some of the native code across multiple applications, if that makes sense to you. But it's kind of nice to think of of this model is it allows you to have application-specific uh, presentations that you then write a bit of, uh, in this case, Objective-C code for mapping to, um, to the native uh, widgets. And the nice thing is that we'll give you a patch set and tell you what's changed, what's been updated, so you only modify those things. So you basically you just run through whatever we tell you has changed, not everything. And it, that's the reason why it actually works so smoothly and it works so well. Um, and if you have questions about this thing, Ian is in the audience, and uh, he'd be happy to, he's, ha he's raising his hand here. At least the people uh, in the room have an uh, opportunity to hunt him down afterwards and, and learn more about this, uh, this, this setup we're building. It is layered, so you will find that anything you describe in the presentation graph description, if we go back to that in here, is actually compiled into a set of services that, uh, that you access across the wire and the definition for... Uh, like the structured messages that, that in, are involved in sending these binary patches across, or this, these patch sets. And that's the, re the reason why we think it's nice to have a layered approach. If something below this level makes more sense to you, you can certainly skip this and just interact with uh, the, the runtime in, in that way instead. So here's the model again. You see, uh, one thing I didn't really mention is there's a, some hookup here that tells you what to do when this is selected. It's basically just like pulling in a, a dot method here. 
Um, but you're never calling the select method from in here. That gets called through a delegate uh, event delegation mechanism. So the roadmap is, is relatively simple. We, I told you that we are going to ship Fletch uh, first, and then we're going to ship uh, Dart for Mobile at the end of the year. And Dart for Mobile is sort of the combination of, of the runtime support for actually making this run on a device like you saw. It's a uh, service description layer that is this low-level thing. And then there's a slightly more opinionated way of expressing presentation graphs and working with them from the two sides. Um, hopefully, this sort of makes sense to you. It's a very practical approach. It's a very low-level approach. But it's something that fits really well into existing, uh, existing apps and works well in order for us to have a, a native story that gives you real native applications, mostly or partly written in Dart. That's it. We have time for maybe one question. If it's short. I scared them. I have a question. Anyone? <laughs> Shoot, Kevin. How does your definition format relate to things like protobuf or other things? Like this IDL. Like IDL format? Yeah. So you, if you're talking about the, the lowest level, like the service description level, um, it's in many ways inspired by protobufs and uh, systems like Cap and Proto. Uh, we've simplified a little bit because we're running in the same process, so we're not worried about version skews at all. So carrying around the weight of, of having a protocol that guarantees forwards and backwards compatibility is not necessary in our case. So it's, you could say, a simplified version of uh, mostly Cap and Proto. So it's not designed for persistence or over the network? Or it's designed for really fast communication between these two things that are versioned together. Thank you. As usual, if you have more questions for Casper, he'll be around. Bug him later. I totally killed the applause there by talking right when everyone was about to start. For Casper, a round of applause.